Welcome to the Will to Lead. My name is Siegfried Anderson. I am the founder of this company called KF Anderson Leadership Academy. We have a three year program called Master of Business Leadership 1, 2, and 3. Why this uh, leadership, uh, why I talk about this here, is this one up here is called Ill Leadership. We call it the elite practice of leadership, and I focus on that. I engineered that word a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting concept, and you also just heard a little piece of music. That is actually my brand music. I call it the Ola and the Freude, a little piece of music from Beethoven. And translated into English, it actually means the tribute to joy and life. And that's actually also the theme through all my three modules up from here. It's a very important thing I have. Your job has to be joyful and it has to help life. And if it doesn't do any of these, job, get a new job. That is my point. I'm the chairman of the company. I started this up in 1986, named it after my father, Kai Fritjof Anderson. Different story. What I have uh, struggled with over the years, especially in the beginning, was what I call the interpretation of management and leadership. And the interesting thing about that was that uh, all this discussion about uh, stereotypes, or I call it uh, uh, leadership styles, I get sick of this. It's all wrong. Bad management, bad leadership, good leadership, good, uh, bad man and leadership doesn't exist, but in people's brain. Good and bad, I mean, what was good, uh, to, uh, to Ten years ago is now bad uh, ma management, bad leadership, and what we do uh, today is good leadership and good management is bad leadership in, in 25 years from now. So it's actually time and place bound. And when I say place, and management and leadership is different from when it takes place in the United States, South Africa, and Mid Africa, uh, down in a Chinese coal mine 800 meters under the surface, and in Denmark. Germany, all over Europe, it's completely different. So it's both time and space bound. That took me to a uh, very big discussion about myself. I said to myself, I have to find a solution on that. And the solution was that I only focused on what I call the elite practice of leadership. Because then I was not forced into a discussion about what is good and what's bad. I could only concentrate on, is this something that is joyful? Is this something that helped life? And in that sense, is it in the elite practice of leadership? And that's what I named it. All my modules goes around this, whatever you join, one, two, three. Another thing I'd like to say about management and leadership is that joining a business school, getting an MBA, is what I call to make a living. Joining our trainings is making living a life. MBL, Master of Business Leadership, is to living a life instead of making a living. I don't see it as either or, I see it as both. And depending on the situation you are in, you need one of them more than the other. For survival, it's always management. If you really want to grow, it's definitely leadership. And if you want to accelerate that growth, it is definitely the elite practice of leadership. Otherwise, it would never work. The other thing is that the next generation that comes up uh, we have to create leadership for them, and I promise you one thing, they are in no sense impressed by what the parents and grandparents have done, have done to the world. They would like to see the difference. And the difference they would like to see is exactly what we are training. This is called leadership. That means to accelerate growth. First leadership, involve all the people, and then accelerate. A leader cannot do that alone. He definitely needs his uh, people to be able to do that. How this all this starts? In 1986, I got a job. I was called up by an <coughs> HR manager from AP Moller Mersk Group in Copenhagen. Uh, he called me up and said that he would like to discuss with me what is good management, what is good leadership, and how do we actually make good managers and good leaders. I said to him, I really don't know. And he looked confused at me and said, yeah, but because as I told him, what I learned in my business school a long time ago is pure nonsense. It has nothing with that to do. And I can say that very firm because before I was 30 years old, 
I was responsible for 300 people's work. No, no, I was not responsible for the people. They could take care of themselves. But their work, I was responsible for that. So I learned this about elite leadership very early and definitely the practice of that very early in life. It turned out that I must have done something right because I mean, 30 years old and 300 people's work. That was a little bit unsteady. The interesting thing is that, that I said to Sven Bilborg, the HR director from AP World Mask, I said to him that I'm trying to figure out. So if you give me the opportunity to make an interview with 20 of your most successful young people from 25, 40, up to 45, then I'm trying to figure out how to do this. I went through the train, uh, through the interviews, and that was a very interesting experience for me because there was absolutely no similarities between the 20 at all. The interesting thing was, I said to him, and that was very interesting, each and every one of all these 20 very successful people were successful in their own way. They only built their success on their own personal strengths, and that was the only main comments I could see with all these uh, analyses I could see between all these 20 uh, very successful managers and leaders. He said to me that this sounded very interesting. So I said to him, I suggest that we make three modules where we build upon people's strengths, the team strengths, and the business strengths, and nothing else. Then we'll figure out how, how that, uh, where that takes us. He said to me that this was exactly the philosophy of the MERS group. When Mr. Molly he heard that, he said, sign on, this is really what we need. So, we discussed that. How can we make these people living their own life? There's only one way to do that, and that is to focus on their strengths and nothing else. And that's exactly what this is all about. That I learned over the years, a couple of, uh, a couple of years, 10 years ago, that growth increasingly comes from return on talent. That's right, because survival is management. But when you start growing, you need some different skills. You need to involve people. And that's talent. I even take it to the extreme that I talk about a critical mass of talent in a company is what we need to accelerate growth definitely and also to growth in general. You can't just grow a company with a survival attitude. That will not work. The interesting thing is also another thing. If we say that leading for survival Managing for survival will give you results one-to-one. -one. Then I learned over the years that if you put leadership in, the way that I talk about it, you will immediately jump from one-to-one to one-to-four. One to one to one to and if you accelerate that, you'll go from one-to-ten and even more. That means one-to-one, one-to-four, one and one-to-ten. And this is how to accelerate business. You can only do that with the elite practice for leadership. In leadership, otherwise it won't work for you. And that's actually where we are training here on these modules. We train in three levels, ascending levels. The world lead, module one. Leadership communication. Team leadership is the module two. And the module three is business leadership. All based on the elite practice of leadership. What you then also, or also figure out, and what you then will figure out here is, there's a big difference between the purpose, the goal, the means, and the consequences. Many, see, many leaders in a company, managers in a company, make a mistake here. They take the purpose for the outcome, the results, and that is actually not the, the point. Let me give you an example. Growth is a consequence of doing many things right. It's not a result, it's a consequence. Increasing revenue is also a consequence of doing many things right. It can never be a goal. And increasing profit, the same story. And a lot of other things. It's all the consequences of doing things right. When we talk about leadership, we only talk about what should we do to get this right. And that is the point here. So the purpose for this, for this training is one and one thing only to create customers. That is actually the main purpose for each and every company around the world. But you can look, take a look at your own company and say what they have at the headline for the purpose for the company. If it's not that, they are not maximizing what they can actually do. Because 
You can't ask a middle manager in a company, any company in this world, to focus on <coughs> growth, increase in revenue and increase in profit. He will never have a clue about what he should do to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, cost cutting. Yes, he plan, you know that. More than he uh, will admit, but that's a different story. The interesting thing here is <coughs> that this actually goes for any company, including the administration, government, whatever, community. Create gospel, that is what a purpose for any company is all about. When we then do that, what's then the purpose for you? Say, standing in the middle management, first line manager, or any manager in between the top management and the bottom, is to build a creative team of talent who initiate a chain reaction of innovative solutions. I repeat, build a creative team of talent who initiate a chain reaction of innovative solutions. That's your job. That's the headline of your job. And that is also the outcome, that is what we are aiming at here at this training. The outcome is over here, it's called the consequences. So what is the consequence of being here in this training? It's up here. These four things. I'll come back to that. But what we're talking about here is then the purpose, the goal, and the means. And the means is you. And you have four, six, I call it dimensions of intelligence that you had never focused on. All this discussion about intelligence is called the logic intelligence from, will bring you from A to Z. Any other intelligence will take your imagined nation to the limit. And that is what we are focusing on. So what will take you to the absolute maximum of your, of your limitations? First and foremost, the one up here is called your creative intelligence. Yeah, that's true. It is strongly connected to the bright side of your personality. It is strongly connected to what you are really good at. But it's definitely <coughs> connected to what I call your best self. And this is something I would like you to focus on. When you put yourself in that spot, everything uh, that you touch will be limitless and effortless. Because the reason why people today, they feel that things is difficult is because they don't have the skills for doing that. And they put all their, what I call the, their own mental uh, immune defense in front of them and say, I can't do that. That's, that's not true. They can do that, but they don't know. And that is what we are doing here. And when I said that, I want to say another thing. People, they say, but Siegfried, I always done my very best and I can't do more. And I know that you're wrong. You have never done. In the past, how, how old you might be, you have never done in the past whatever you could do to the absolutely maximum. I have been through 20, having had 20,000 people in front of me, I learned one thing. None of them, few of them, yes, did it. But the majority of them, 96% of them, never ever surpassed what I call 50%. 50% of their full capability. They all use these 50%. What you will learn here on this training, and what I'll teach you, is that you, a way to do that and to get, uh, surpass that, go beyond that, is what we are aiming at here. It's strongly connected to your creative intelligence. Today, it plays a trick for you. And that's the reason why it's only up to 40%, maybe 50%. Rarely 80. Very seldom 96. Your unlimited energy. You know, energy, what is that? Energy is that <clears throat> when you do something that you're really fond of, that you feel is really funny. How much energy do you put into this? Make sure that whatever you do is something that you like to do and it has a purpose. It has to be, you have to work for humanity. It has to be for the life of the earth, otherwise it doesn't work. With that you can actually <coughs> take your energy level up to what I call to electrify your energy. That means you can actually turn it up and down just like that. And I'll show you how to do that. That's a different story. Another thing is here your stamina and your fortitude. One thing is <clears throat> that each and everyone can do what they like to do. And people, they rarely 
go for and do things that they don't like to do, but they need to do because this is necessary to do. And the interesting thing about that is <clears throat> that <clears throat> you can actually control this as well. That means even if you get under a huge stress, stressful situation, you don't get stressed. The interesting thing is here how to maintain and how to control these two words and how to use that in practice. So you see, the reason why people they feel stressed is because they can't control their stamina and their fortitude. That means it just runs away with them. Here in this training, balance in life means that you keep this completely under control. It's nothing to do with what I call your private life and your work life. It's a balance between what you uh, do, the results that comes out of that, and the joy that you get from that. That this is the balance. The balance between uh, uh, joy and <clears throat> life force and results. That's the balance. When you get stressed, it's because one, there's an imbalance. You're either not good enough of, of, of creating results or this here drops down. Your life force simply just disappears and you get stressed because you don't know how to maintain that. That's this one up here. Your joy and enthusiasm. <clears throat> you remember the first uh, your first car when you got that? How joyful you was, right? You were so enthusiastic. You phoned up your brother-in-law and said to him, now I got the car. That's amazing. I just, uh, just tried it and paid it cash and so amazing, right? You and your fiancé or your spouse or whoever was, you know, it took an extra turn around the sun. The city just to show that now you're there, right, with your new car. You had an idea about that either. They were one point of view. They didn't, and you all actually also knew they would do that. But you were so joyful, and you were feel so enthusiastic about this car. So even when you went to bed, you remember that? Take the curtains away, it was still there down there on the street. You were so fantastic, right? And the day after, when you drove to work, to work at work for the first time, remember that? There was no way into joy. What about now? That's yeah, true. You take it for granted. It's just there. You're not joyful about it anymore. Why not? I know people can sit out the highway on a motorway in a queue two hours long, right? And grumble about it. Everything. They take the phone and <clears throat> scream after each and every one in the phone, you know, they literally hate this two hours in the car. Come on, it's your favorite car. It's the first time ever in your life you can sit for two hours alone in your own car, favorite car, right? And really enjoy your car. Just sitting there, right? Two hours in the queue. There's no such a thing like two hours in the queue in your favorite car. It's like buying your favorite sofa, right? Sitting there for two hours. It's very enjoyable. You say, don't tell me that you don't like your car, right? That is too cute. That, well, that, that was this one. So whatever. Right? Your spouse, your house, your flat, your boss, your kids, right? Take, let's take this about the boss, right? From this training, you go right into your boss and tell him, dear boss, I'll tell you one thing. I am so enthusiastic about my job. I really feel enjoying it. It's the best job I ever had, at least. <clears throat> and you are the best boss. Thank you very much. That was the only thing I'd like to say, and then you go out. And people say, secret? You can't say that to your boss. I said, ah, interesting. This is called a, <clears throat> this is called a mental immune defense that plays tricks with you. Why can't you just walk in and go out? Tell him to go out again. Mental immune defense. Okay, that was this. Here we have the next one called your clarity of judgment. How clear are you, persistent are you in doing the right thing from the early morning, late night, every day? It's like you hit pearl on the string. Yep, everyone is right. Every decision, whatever you do, is just perfectly right. If this is not the case, there's, <coughs> there's no clarity. Special situations is completely blurred, you can't see anything, and when it comes to the adjustment, end up with a distorted adjustment with a high precision. Yes, that's true. With high precision, you take the wrong decision.
This is called distorted adjustment. Okay, get rid of this. We discussed that on the train as well. Your <coughs> impressive ability to get things done. That's true. Whatever you do, what has to be, what is needed to be done, even that you do, that is what I call impressive. We take a close look at that as well. This is what I call the means. It's all about what I call internal, how to organize yourself internal to get all this right and take it in the same direction, let it find exactly at what you want to do, exactly this, build a creative team of talent who initiate a chain reaction of innovative solutions. Then we'll figure out one thing. Critical mass of talent is an explosive asset. You know, an asset is a is a, a car, it's a building, uh, all the machinery you have in the company, the IT system, this is an asset. A critical mass of talent is the same thing. It's an asset. I want you to look at that as an asset in all the future. If it's a little too, too small, you have to make it build it up to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you reach what I call a critical mass. Then everything up here, innovative solutions, they just come and come and come and come and come and there's definitely no end to this. This process you can't control. I call this accelerating solutions, accelerating the business. And that's exactly this one up here. But it comes down from there. Yes, it's explosive because you can't control it. People like get so many ideas. It's really amazing. Okay? Then we go to the consequences. What you get out of this training is this. First and foremost, the headline, live your life in triumph. Yes? You got it? Live your life in triumph. Give and fill people with life force. Have you ever heard about the word motivation? First and foremost, it's a misspell. Motivating is really spelled like this. Motif, action. Yes, that's right, that's missing a C. But what is motivation? That's actually this. To give and fill people with life force. That is what you should do. But how do I do that? Yeah, that's true. This is what we trained uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the course. On top of that, you get these four things here as well. First and foremost, use the bright side of your personality only. Your shadow side, forget it. Your black side, you can leave that at home, you don't need to do that. So we're focusing on the bright side of your personality and from on that point, you'll end up being like your mom always saw you. Such a beautiful human being like you. That's this one, right? The second one is this one, practice the leadership. I have 10 dimensions of intelligence underneath here that you have to train. And we train that on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the train. Then the next one here is called well-being <coughs> to your people. And the next one is use comfort as a driving force. The interesting thing about these two words is very interesting. First and foremost, well-being has changed completely in our time. I looked up the classical understanding of well-being and you won't believe what I found. But I found one thing. It is <clears throat> that you challenge yourself to the absolutely maximum of what you can. When you overcome that, you feel so enriched and so joyful. This is called well-being. Oxford Dictionary, classic understanding of well-being, 200 years ago. That's this. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? So this is what we train. We have a four intelligence here. We also need to train dimensions of intelligence. Comfort, the same thing. We also have four things here. Classic understanding of comfort 200 years ago, Oxford Dictionary says the following. Always use your strength. Unbelievable, that's true. Nowadays, people, if you comfort, that means a longer vacation, better red wine and a bigger hammock. Forget it. That's not the point. It's completely twisted in our time. 
So use your strengths as much as you can. This is that. And that's three other things. But we will train that when we come back. And I definitely look, uh, look forward to that. You can go in and book yourself here because you feel this sounds very interesting for you. Remember, it's all about living your life. Your professional skills, we don't discuss. We only discuss leadership. And here comes leadership for life. In leadership for life. That is what we're discussing. You go in, free type earlier, kfanderson.com slash booking. Go in to find a place there. You can take it in Danish and Denmark and almost all the other trains are in English around the world. There are very exo exotic places where you can go to. So I definitely look forward to see you there. Just go in and sign you up and I welcome you and I look forward to that. And then I wish you a really good day. Think about all this and uh, come back. I look forward. I wish you a really good day. Take care of yourself and your family. See you in the future. Thank you very much.